Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Huff, and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Studio Museum in Harlem. On behalf of the Studio Museum and our partner, Maisel's Documentary Center, we'd like to thank you from wherever you may be tuning in from, as the digital options are limitless. I personally send greetings from Harlem, where the vendors are still out here with their incense and black pride flags and t-shirts, the card games and board games are happening in the parks, and the streets are filled with old school soul interweaving with the latest trap beats. Tonight, we're beyond thrilled to provide this intergenerational, multidisciplinary conversation around the documentary Mr. Soul and the community and institution building of its visionary, Ellis Hazlett. Our team saw the parallels between the cultural, social, economic, and political moment of 1968, when Soul, the TV show, and the Studio Museum arrived on the scene, and the climate of today in 2020. We're once again, because these are cycles, we are witnessing a demanding now as then that the systems in place are broken, flawed, and exclusionary. And we are responding now as then with acts of radicality, revolution, and a rejection of the respectable, while remembering the necessity to preserve spaces for love, care, joy, and stillness. And now I'd like to introduce our luminous panel for the evening. Producer Melissa Hazlip is an award-winning filmmaker based in New York her work responds to pressing social issues at the intersection of racial justice, social justice, activism, and representation. Female transformation and empowerment are at the core of all of her ideas, with the goal being to advocate and amplify the voices of women and people of color. Melissa's feature documentary, Mr. Soul, has been awarded a finalist for the 2019 inaugural Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film, a new annual prize that recognizes a filmmaker whose documentary uses original research and compelling narrative to tell stories that touch on some aspect of American history. The film won Best Music Documentary at the 2018 International Documentary Association Awards and the 2019 Focal Award for Best Use of Archival Footage in an Entertainment Production. George Faison is an American dancer, choreographer, teacher, and theater producer based in Harlem. With a career that's taken him from the Arthur Mitchell Dance Company to the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, and then to founding the George Faison Universal Dance Experience and co-founding the Faison Firehouse Theater, Faison is a stirring example of an artist who takes from the sometimes ugly and hateful world around him and creates beauty. Whether choreographing a dance about slavery or drug abuse to creating a tornado with dancers in the whiz, for which he received a 1975 Tony and Drama Desk Award for Best Choreography, or amplifying the universality of dance through his work on the stage shows of popular music acts, like Stevie Wonder, Earth, Wind and & Fire, and Roberta Flack, Faison has stayed true to himself and the result is a career three decades long and counting. Joanna Bellarado Samuels is the founder of We Buy Gold, a roving gallery presenting exhibitions, commission projects, and public events, and is a director at the Jack Shaman Gallery in New York. She is on the curatorial team of the Racial Imaginary Institute, which seeks to change the way we imagine race in the US and internationally as well by lifting up and connecting the work of artists, writers, knowledge producers, and activists with audience seeking thoughtful, innovative conversations and experiences. Joanna was a founding director of For Freedoms, the first artist-run super PAC, which uses art to inspire deeper political engagement for citizens who wanna have greater impact on the American political landscape. And our moderator, Taylor Renee Aldridge, has recently been hired as the visual arts curator and program manager at the California African American Museum. Prior, she worked as a writer and independent curator in Detroit, Michigan. In 2015, along with art critic Jessica Lynn, she co-founded Arts Black, a journal of art criticism for Black perspectives. Taylor is a recipient of the 2016 Andy Warhol Foundation Creative Capital Arts Writers Grant for short form writing and the 2019 Rabkin Foundation Award for Art Journalism. Taylor has recently organized the exhibition Annunciated Life, which will open at CAM in fall 2020. Annunciated Life and its epilogue in Spirit at Coda, opening at Red Bull in spring 2021, utilized Black spiritual beliefs as a point of departure for considering modes of surrender, looking at the movements, sounds, and corporeal expressions that have generated lexicons of communication within and beyond Black church sites. We are proud to provide closed captioning for this program courtesy of the Helen Frankenthaler's Foundation's Frankenthaler Digital Initiative and Art Bridges. We would like to extend additional gratitude to City the Stavros Niarcos Foundation, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation for their continued support of in Harlem programming like this one. 
And I'd also like to offer a huge thank you to my team of Cheyenne Marcano and Raven Ruffin, as well as Sydney Murphy, whose diligent and dedicated efforts brought this program into fruition, as well as Allison Lights of Maisel's, who's running the back end tonight. And while our panelists are bonding within their Zoom room, we encourage you to make use of the YouTube chat space and connect with respect and kindness with your fellow viewers. At the end of the conversation, there will be time for a Q&A, so please send any questions you may have over the course of the talk to public programs at studiemuseum.org. For more information about upcoming exhibitions, events, and online resources, please check out our website, studiemuseum.org. And if you haven't gotten a chance to watch Mitzvah Soul yet, please do by visiting our website or Maisel's at maisel's.org to purchase a ticket. Please keep in touch. And we're thinking of our friends in California under orange skies. And with that, I pass the screen along to Taylor. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Dan. Um, I just wanna echo your sentiments about um, our hearts with the people in California. I'm broadcasting from LA and it feels especially dystopic here. And so I'm, I'm especially thankful and in deep gratitude to be in community with you all here, albeit virtually. And it's great to see your beautiful faces. And I just wanna thank each and every one of you for joining us today. Um, I wanna just dive right in and um, start off with Melissa specifically. Um, since, you've, since you've been so foundational to making uh, this documentary, please tell us how this project came to be and what your intentions were in making this documentary, Mr. Soul, in honor of your uncle, Ellis Hayslip. Artists who love putting people together, especially an artist who is a producer, director, and host, and filmmaker. All of that is very black. Melissa, Melissa, I think I think your sound is is either <coughs> muted or a bit distorted. Do you mind speaking into the mic a little bit more? Is that better? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. that's much better. Thank you. Sure. Sorry about that. So I'll just say that I'm thrilled to be here. And we're so excited to be able to celebrate Ellis Hazlip, who was an impresario, uh, believed in the arts, believed in black institution building, and was instrumental in all of the above. And so excited to share this film with you, Mr. Soul, which is really a love letter to black culture. Uh, in that we are telling the story of not only the biography of the man, but a biography of a very special show called Soul, which really had a life of its own and was really a part of the fabric of Harlem, of New York, and of the African uh, diaspora uh, nationwide and worldwide, really. So Ellis Hazlip is the inspiration behind this film and also this idea of remembering where we came from, thinking about our ancestors, exploring and interrogating the politics that have held us back, and really looking at the birth of diversity and inclusion in television and this notion of art as culture and culture as movement and movement as change. And I was very inspired to make this film because I realized that the Soul Show, which was on from 68 to 73, is an absolute gold mine. It's a time capsule, if you will, of beautiful black culture and black excellence, black representation. Black love, Black strength, Black encouragement, Black sister and brotherhood. And to see all of this on television in 1968 was revolutionary. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could bring this back and explore how far we've come and how far we have yet to go in this quest toward liberation, representation, and all the intersections that the show uh, provided uh, as it really create an expansiveness in terms of the perception of African-American art and culture. Uh, and of course, since I loved Ellis very much and I realized he was somewhat of an unsung hero, I felt it was time to tell this story. And in this moment in particular, it seemed like a wonderful time to bring it to the public. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. It feels especially poignant in this moment, given all that we're grappling with and struggling through. Um, so thank you. Thank you for this offering. Thank you for your work. Um, a, a big through line in this, this project is this concept and this idea, um, unrelenting sort of mission of instituting our own spaces, instituting Black spaces, Black run spaces. And Mr. Soul and the, the, Soul, the Soul Show was facilitated primarily in part um, with all, an all Black cast and all Black staff through public television. Um, and around the same time, just for context, The Black Scholar was also active during that time, the, the TV show, The Black Scholar. Um, and so I wanna just transition a little bit um, in thinking about self-institution and creating our own platforms and spaces. And Joanna, you have worked in a range of leadership capacities within your field. And more recently, you decided to create an art gallery offering specifically for the people in bed -Stuy which platforms emerging contemporary artists. Similarly, Mr. Hazlip sought to create a live work space for artists in Harlem, and he often featured young and up and coming creatives. I wanna talk about your endeavor, We Buy Gold, and the impulse to specifically create space in the bed -Stuy neighborhood. And can you share more about your work at Jack Shaman as a director in contrast with instituting your own gallery in Brooklyn? Um, I've been at, I guess I'll start with Jack Shaman because it came first. I've been there for just over 12 years now. Um, you know, working in a gallery, primarily the responsibility is to shepherd the advocates for artists that you represent. So you have a roster and um, kind of the honor of working with artists over a long period of time and helping to strategize with them and build with them, support them in, you know, on all of their endeavors and to help build their careers and kind of be the, the kind of the shield for them also and, and to help to, you know, allow them to navigate through the art world and through the world and to really help their voices gain platforms. Um, so truly an honor. I love the program that I work with. I've worked with a lot of the artists for a really long period of time and watched them really grow um, from really young emerging stages to far more kind of established spaces. Um, and three years ago, I suppose it is, that I started We Buy Golds. And that was really coming from a place of wanting to work with more artists, being really excited about a lot of the work that I was seeing, a lot of the cultural production that was happening, um, but also really wanting to remove myself from this kind of very institutional space that is Chelsea. And, never really feeling as though it was something that was, you know, centering myself personally. I think that all of my work ends up being quite personal, not to make it about me, but I think it's a helpful reference point for kind of thinking about how I've navigated these spaces. And I live in bed -Stuy, and it's just such a clear departure for me to leave home and to, to go to work and to be working with artists who look like me, who are sharing ideas. And I just felt like that wasn't happening at home and how important it would be to try to create space that was more welcoming to myself, to people who look like me, who are interested in these artists also, but um, perhaps were challenged by the kind of exclusionary space that these institutional kind of environments and geographies kind of build and foster? And then how do you also build a space that is poking holes at those very kind of institutional ideas and those kind of ways of working and, and building gallery spaces? And, you know, how do we poke holes in that? And how do we make that generative? And without a kind of idea about any answers that would come of it, just being really interested in taking up more space in that way. Um, it was always the idea that we by gold would move around as we all move around and um, have kind of flexibility and really engage with the geography of wherever it ended up. But it was really important for me to start at home, which, you know, I opened We Buy Gold like 50 feet from my doorstep. Um, and it was important for me to kind of bring artists that I would otherwise be working at with in a very different landscape at home with the community that I, I live with. And I think um, enjoyed having something a little bit closer to them that was more open to them. Um, yeah, inclusion and access, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, George, uh, I want to bring you into the, the conversation here. And um, 
I'm super excited that you are able to join us as someone who has been featured on the show and who was in community with Ellis. I wanna ask you about the atmosphere of that moment in black entertainment history. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be featured on the show and what led you to offer the performance that you did on Soul? Um, when you uh, talk about the times, such as uh, 1968, which is a reflection of these times today, everybody is trying to find community, trying to find home. I've, I've, uh, so when you look at 1968, coming from Howard University, um, at that at that particular time, in search, uh, having danced with Alvin Ailey and so forth, I formed my own dance company, the Universal Dance Experience. In 19, once I left Alvin Ailey in 1970, but um, it was still a very rugged place. We had been thrown out of restaurants. You know, we picketed, we marched, we've done a, a great deal of of uh, protests in search of our identity. And not too many of the images on TV were featuring any of us. I, Ellis Hazlett, the pioneer of all this with the vision to see us on the screen, to pr uh, be provocative enough to bring up the subjects and the people together like the last poets or some, Sonia Sanchez or Maya Angelou or any of these people who he knew. Alice, Ellis was also a stage manager as well for the great uh, uh, Bennett Carroll who uh, had founded the Urban Arts Corps. And I've, I've had the pleasure of working with Bennett who, who explored those subjects. She also nurtured um, uh, people like Cecily Tyson and brought them along. There were not too many subjects that we could, that we broached uh, only because we weren't asked. Ellis asked the question. So if we, when we um, were uh, dreaming in our classroom, daydreaming in our day-to-day -day lives about what we wanted to be or what we could could be. All we had to look at is white people. And when we looked at them, we asked the question, where am I? Why can't I do this? Why can't I, why am I segregated? Why am I doing nothing with my life? Because if we looked at the greater society, we have to realize that we did not, we were, or we were not featured, you know, in that instance. I'm not really saying everything that I want, but we had to find it. There were no grants. There were no, nobody was not, there were nobody looking for us. There was nobody waiting for us. So we had to create in our, in our cubicles, in New York, in our little pockets of, of um, of creativity. We sang, we danced, we did all of those things. But Ellis gave us a bigger platform in which we could imagine. In Dancing with Ailey, I uh, went to Africa in 1966. And observing all of those people, I thought I had really found home. But I didn't really find home until I came back from Africa and then found, found myself in the turmoil of the 60s. Detroit was on fire, D DC was sizzling. You know, they had burned all of our, these cities, but that was our cities. But where was our self-esteem? Where was our um, genius? It could only be found in the stories we told. Some of them were harsh stories. Some of them were bitter stories. But where was the joy? Where was the celebration of the Black man? Yes, Alvin did, you know, in his masterpiece, Revelations, gave us um, uh, those spirituals. I, I would even call him the uh, father of liturgical dance. 
if it, if you look at today, every church, you know, has has their little choreographers and 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 great dance choruses and so forth. But I felt that it wasn't enough. I I felt that he it wasn't contemporary enough. So I and you know, and I grew up with music of Otis Redding, and I did. I observed gazelles in the Serengeti. I, I saw my brothers and sisters on the streets of New York nodding through the overdosing on the drugs that they took. We were all there. How do you put it into a format that we could live with? So in creating Poppy, uh, which was a ballet, and poppy is the drug that heroin is derived from. And in that, I was able to create with Miles Davis, who gave me my first soundtrack to dance to because of his, uh, and his interest in dance. And I don't know if any, a lot of people realize that. So I made a dance about that. Ellis was at all of those concerts. So I danced about slaves and called it slaves. I didn't make up any other name. It was slaves. And it, and it traced the, the, uh, us from uh, the Serengeti through the Middle Passage to Charleston and the Austrian block and so forth. But I also wanted to, to show, even though we suffered through the mis Middle Passage, I wanted to show how beautiful we were before the white man came to Africa, before the Portuguese, before the English, be before all of those people who would exploit us, you know, once they brought us here to America, or how, how we loved each other. And that caused me to explore our own music. Now we grew up with um, with rock and roll or R and B or fought over the, the title of who who created it. You know, between you know Holly, uh, you know the uh, Elvis Presley and Blue Blade, uh, what is that? Uh, Blue suede shoes and. Um, and uh, what is his name? What is his name? Uh, my, um, um, uh, Papa, you, not Papa, you treat you. There's so many people that flood my mind because we had a new record coming out in the ghettos of, of America every week. And we had a star to emerge every week. And, and that buoyed us. So when I chose Otis Redding to show romantic love, to show you know, how we, we loved each other, I was able to use everything I had, my ballet training, my modern training, my ethnic training, all of that. And we grew up on the East Side along with Inazaki, Chuck Davis, and all of the people. And we performed at, uh, at, the, um, at different, different venues, creating different dances every week. We couldn't get enough of ourselves. So that led to all of the things that I, I really stand for. You know, my own entrepreneurship, my own pressing these stories. And Ellis was there like a big brother to give us another hand up. We then took the tooth, but who had a TV at that time? Not, you know, so it was like, where, who are we going to do this? So I was so proud of the TV show, uh, the, the TV show that I did for Ellis, that, you know, I thought, now I will be known. Now people will know me as a Black person, Black choreographer, and know deep, more deeply that I felt, I cried, I re rejoiced, I did all of those things that other human beings do. Everybody else enjoys that. But Ellis gave us free reign. He had discussions. Not everything was on the screen. And all the people that he brought, I would later meet in life, later in life, or choreograph for them, or stage them, or direct them. I know that's a title that you often leave out, but I've done the Black, directed the Blacks. I've, you know, I've done more direction 
you know, since I won all those awards and done all those things because I needed words. And we had so many poets. We had uh, so many poets. Uh, and uh, like, like uh, the last poets who gave us the, uh, uh, you know, the audacity to say, nigga, 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 before, before uh, you, everybody got, you know, kind of outraged by Richard P P Pryor. They were there on our Ellis's screen doing that same thing and teaching us or the love that we should have for each other. And here we are. That was 1968. Here we are, 2020, with the young people on the streets today, joined by their white and Latino and all, all of their bro African brothers, doing, joining hands, fighting for the same thing, a place, a home, family, as, as, as we have discussed just prior to this. All of those things were reawakened uh, through Ellis. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that, George. What I, what I especially appreciate about your performance, which is featured in the film, is this sort of attention to authenticity and a rawness that was consistent throughout the, the, the filming of the show and its duration. Um, and I think what, what Ellis was able to provide for us was this leaning away from respectability politics and sort of this refining of blackness that um, many black people at the moment felt that they had to lean into. And um, there, for me, there is this sort of assertion of a certain type of value that can be raw, that can be honest, that can be without respectability and it still be presentable and uh, sort of authentic, authentic, excuse me, in the way that it's depicting the multiplicity of blackness, if that makes sense. Yes. So I, I want to sort of talk a little bit more about this idea of value. Um, at the time, the idea of the show um, was so revolutionary because it, it was interested in exploring the quote unquote Negro question or it was, excuse me, it wasn't interested in exploring the Negro question. And most importantly, it was not aiming to sort of redress Black American visibility in this cloak of respectability. The show was raw, it was authentic, and it displayed a multiplicity of Blackness, what Blackness might look like. There was, a, there was little value placed on this effort by the mainstream, and thus the show was eventually discontinued. I wanna retroactively look at that moment in this context and consider where we are now Black representation in popular culture has become a currency that is so fluid, sought after, and sometimes exploited. In all of visual culture, Black art is circulating widely. Um, George and Melissa, I want to I want to hear how you think Ellis sort of ascribed value to Black visibility and pop culture in that moment. And then Joanna, I want to hear from you and hear you talk about how as a gallerist you are navigating the relative surge and circulation and value placed on visual art in this moment made by black artists. Okay, so who did we have to compare ourselves to? You know, the Roberta Black song, compared to what? Make it real. That's Les McCann and all of those people. We were hammered with the cries of our brothers who were also writing these things, Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, Shining Star, or even um, Sly and the Family Stone. Everybody is a star. We believe that. We took that home. We ate that for breakfast. We got up, put on our clothes. We tore our clothes off of us, cut our hair, put bones in our nose, and did everything that was, and they were all, pieces and parts of our culture. We picked up all the pieces that were scattered. I mean, you know, like I'm so very, as I said before, I'm so very proud of the people, the young people today. All of you who have gone to college, you, who have had to, you know, um, be shepherded through by the larger organizations. Well, uh, well, I had the, I had the good luck to, to, um, as I said, 
be nurtured by the teachers, professors, and so forth at Howard University. It was Black, and it was Black for a very, very long time. And the poets and the artists that you have, Stal, uh, Stamanda, um, do, uh, do you know Stamanda De, um, Clark? I think that's, that's it. But the, the artists that were trained at Howard were, um, were really incredible. The drama department, Medea in Africa, I saw there first um, and had never thought of even seeing that in the African style. So, uh, and then to see uh, Jesse Norman for the first time, this black girl come out on the stage, you know, not as refined as the Jesse Norman that we have, have known. And then to hear what issued for out of her voice. It was incredible, you know, to hear that kind of power in German, no less. But it, it was all of those things. We experimented with all those things. And Owen Dotson and Ted Schein and all those teachers there only encouraged it, only encouraged it. And, and the, the, the lessons and the people that I, I, I found there uh, were just incredible. I can't say enough about finding yourselves, about believing yourselves and going out there and doing it. You have so, so much, no matter where you come from. I don't care where you come from, what piece of, of uh, reality that you have in growing up. I, I noticed that uh, Joanna was talking about going through the rigors you know, of, of school and trying to find you know, somebody that, that she could relate to that looked like her or it's images that even looked like her. No, we, we could see, you turn right, turn left, you saw us and that's what we grew up in. Absolutely, absolutely. And I wanna take this moment to shout out Bradford Young who is the cinematographer on the film and also a Howard alum as am I, as is, as is George. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, to your point, George, it's, it's a very sort of, significant thing to come up in a black institution and be reaffirmed in your, in, your, um, in your being in that way. But on the other hand, I was also had the good fortune to dance with the American Light Opera Company that was located in a church in Georgetown at Trinity Church with, you know, the Kennedys went there and so forth, but they had a, a, a American Light Opera. I learned all of the, the canon of the American white theater, their pajama game, showboat. So, you know, uh, all of those early musicals I learned, I learned there. So I had a hand up. So I got, I had in a sense, both worlds and grew up with uh, Georgia Engel who was Mar on Mary Tyler Moore and uh, all, of, all of, it takes all of it. It takes all of it. And, and guess what, folks? You own all of it. You own every bit of it. You know, we not, it's not just the architecture, it's not just the picking of cotton. You made everything. Absolutely. And so why not own it? Absolutely. Melissa, what, what are your thoughts on, on this idea of value and your uncle's relationship to, or work rather, and rigor in instituting a certain value through this platform? It's very exciting to think about that, and this idea of ascribing value. And I think that Ellis Hazlip already knew that Black excellence existed, and he wasn't asking permission or needing validation or justification of Blackness. He, he was already sharing a love affair with blackness, with our blackness. And to put that on screen and to say, we're not here to entertain you. We're not here to necessarily educate you. We're here to share in the black experience. And whatever you take from it, that's great. But this was like the fundamental for us by us mentality, you know, that before the hashtag was in, that's what he was feeling. And this notion that he was saying, this is what is happening in the Black America. We are a nation of people, not just a nation within a nation. And this idea of the burgeoning Black arts movement 
helping us understand what it meant to be black in America, what it meant to be black on this planet, Ellis was, was aware of that and was, was creating a platform. You know, Soul was not only a vehicle for African-American artistry, but it was a platform, as George says, for uh, the fight for social justice and a political discussion, which you didn't usually see on television and you certainly didn't see expressed from people of color. And so this idea, when you think about all those extraordinary artists who were on the show, we know eventually that they gained, you know, from Gladys Knight, uh, Al Green, Stevie Wonder, Nikki Ashford and Simpson. Baldwin, Ashford and Simpson. We know that later they acquired this sort of transcendent status as celebrities, as supernovas. But the thing with Ellis is that they were already part of the black community. They were already had meaning. They already had value. And so he wasn't waiting for them to become stars. And he was often pushing people forward who didn't have stardom or hadn't been recognized or ascribed value, as you say. And I think that's, that was really key in when you look at these interviews and you see people expressing themselves, you see this nascence of uh, beauty and power and pride. Um, and that was really remarkable and I think revolutionary for this show. And uh, also, when you think about situating the show, and it was barely post-civil rights, what is post anything anyway nowadays? But this idea, this dawning of like the Vietnam War and you know Nixon's hard stance on black people, all of these intersections were coming together and almost cre really creating the opportunity for soul to exist and for this beautiful presentation, this undiluted, unapologetically black, true mirroring of, of our culture, which was so unique. And I think he captured that vibration and that word is very important to him. This idea of vibration, vibration of the black culture. Um, and that that was the beginning of something that he knew would be yes. bigger and bigger. And that there, it was, it was a grander, how do I say this? Like a presentation of the fluidity of black thought and identity and this opportunity for black people to present their critical thinking. And that value was already innate. And I think he always felt that way, year after year, season after season. And when you see the show, which is really remarkable and you see the journey of the show and the journey of the people and the journey of the music, the beautiful aesthetics of the show, the, uh, as Greg Tate says, the follicle militancy of the Afro on display, you just see this innate, gorgeous beauty. Um, and I love that Ellis Hazup was curating that beauty. He was hosting the culture, but it was also curating black joy. And we tried to put all of that in the film because you don't really see that. You don't really see the birth of that anywhere else in our culture because we kind of skipped this, this beginning, this naissance, if you will. Um, so I, mm. I love that you, get to fall in love with the show and the man and the people, but you're really looking at this time capsule and this just beautiful moment of black truth mm -hmm. in a way that you don't even see now without an agenda, mm -hmm. uh, especially this idea of value and who values. And I think the key thing is the gaze, is that he didn't present the culture through the white gaze or through the white uh, ju justification or validation. He just said, this is, the black lens, this is how we see ourselves and we're just gonna share it with you. And um, yeah, that was really truly revolutionary. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Joanna, I wanna transition to you and sort of pose a similar question just in terms of thinking about visual art specifically. Um, there has been this proliferation of uh, black visibility within the art world, I think. Um, and it seems like the art world is just catching up to the innate value that we have been moving with for centuries um, and especially decades. Um, I'm thinking about the recent Vanity Fair covers. I'm thinking about Carrie, Jane, Carrie James Marshall in the background of a Diddy party. Uh, it seems that like visual art is, is, is uh, as it pertains to, the, to, to black artists, it's, it's very fluid and very much in the fore of this moment. And I'm curious to know as a gallerist, as someone who has their pulse on every aspect of the art world in this moment, how are you navigating this, this concept and this idea of value as it relates to black art? Hmm. 
Um, well, I don't know if I have the pulse on every aspect of this, but I, I want to start by saying that Melissa, I was so inspired by that. That was that was amazing, and I you know I consider myself operating in such a different space. But you know, to think about that, like the radicality of that innate value and declaring that innate value, and yeah, that's and whenever I'm asked about to talk about the moment, I get this pit in my stomach, and I. You know, we are not a moment, we were here yesterday, we're gonna be here tomorrow. And there is that innate value that we all know so so salient, it's so salient to us and so clear that um, I, I end up getting really kind of resistant to even the conversation about like, what do we do with this moment? Where are we? What is, you know, what is happening? I mean, I think that just, it's, it, it's exciting. I'm really excited about the visibility. I'm really excited about a lot of artists getting, um, you know, mentioned and considered and discussed in, in, in a way that they were not before. But I always sit back into that idea around innate value and how important it is to kind of, you know, reject and to be really cautious and to, and in, in my case, be as protective as I think that is necessary or is, is asked for in, in regards to the artists that I work with in terms of like <laughs> keeping that, you know, making sure that um, discussions are really around the work and not just about them showing up and allowing, you know, spaces to feel as though they've done the work um, and really, you know, forcing the real discussions around that work and just continue, you know, plugging away at that every day. But I, I'd have to say that, that I've always kind of felt like that was my place and my work even before however many years we want to consider this happening. And, um, but I'm, I'm excited by whatever this is, but mostly because I end up in more conversations like with the three of, of y'all and and to me that that's happening with more regularity than that has been before. And I, I'm excited by that and I'm inspired by that. And I think that that will help to solidify a kind of more and more spaces, more spaces for ourselves, for the artists that we work with um, without thinking about the rest of, of the world that's kind of you know late to the party. And I think that also, um, you know, when you hear that saying that when you hear a whisper for the first time, it sounds like a scream. And, you know, in my work, if you, if you step back and you actually look at the numbers, the metrics and our own, you know, the space that we take up in the global art, art world, it is still ridiculously, it's so minor and it's so small. So, you know, that's also part of, my resistance to even having a discussion about a moment when we're not even anywhere close to being represented in, in ownership in, in the marketplace as relates to, you know, I'm speaking very specifically around the art world, but I, that's certainly not uh, unique to the art world. But, you know, how do, we, how do we keep pushing? How do we, how do we take up more space? How do we support our, our, each other's spaces? How do we, demand sustainability of those spaces so that we can stop talking about moments and really understand how how little we've been able to you know scrape away at and collect for ourselves in the grand scheme of things yeah. and also you know, i'm jumping on that i'm just i'm so inspired by what you've said and especially that we're we're often not questioned about our own sustainability as artists as black artists yeah. That's never really a question. You hear it talked about in film and you hear it talked about so many other genres of the arts, but nobody ever really talks about sustainability for Black artists. And I think this conversation that we're having is so inspiring because we can open up about that and talk about why institutions and Black institutions are so important. And this notion of constant support and Black gives back and Black philanthropy, all of these questions yeah. come into play. Yeah. Right. That that idea has only dawned on me just recently, you know, our own philanthropy. But you know, like when I could only pay my dancers like $50 a week and give them a happy meal, oh. and like something that's like, when we were creating Otis and we were doing all of these things or even creating a, a space you and you're very, you have to create your own space. I was always after, you know, having my own studio, always after having, you know, allowing the dancers to come to a space and be treated like artists, you know. Uh, so that was always my, um, my my goal. But I also promised myself if I did not make the money, if I did not, you know, get the other things that, you know, I would some, 
how lead that, but that never happened. So I just constantly worked hard, got the real estate, to, you know, to happen and so forth, and hire the dancers that, uh, uh, you know, or give them a space. And you know, I did outreach for uh, the last twenty years, the Respect Project, and we went all five boroughs and even into the prisons, you know, Rikers and women's house of detention and so forth with our message. And I had the kids um, write about their, their, uh, their experiences. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just um, our coming together. We weren't going to just sing. We weren't gonna dance, and we, but we were gonna write and we were gonna become literate about what we were doing. You know, because half of them had not, you know, weren't, you know, up to par as as far as those those kinds of things that the academics were concerned. So they all, yes, they all wanted to rap, they all wanted to dance, but first of all, you had to speak and articulate, you know, some of your ideas. Thank you for that, George. I really appreciate um, your comments, Melissa, about sustainability. And um, for me, one of the most striking okay. aspects okay. in the film, okay. one of the most striking aspects in the film um, that I appreciated the most was uh, this exchange between Baldwin and Giovanni and the interview that they, they filmed in England. Uh, there's this deep sort of tenderness and reverence that's captured that's unlike any interview I've ever seen. And what's palpable for me is uh, this visible display of mentorship. Um, which is remarked about in the documentary at Lynn. Uh, but there's also this teachable moment that happens from Giovanni to Baldwin, in my opinion. And the mentorship is twofold and goes both ways. Uh, the exchange between elder and youth has been so foundational to how many Black folks are able to thrive and grow through respective industries. And I wanna hear from each of you about the significance of mentorship and as well as menteeship in the context of this film and also with regard to your, your respective practices and works. Well, how do you learn? How do you perfect your craft? You know, about, yes, by the trial and error, uh, but holding you to the tenets of what is excellence. And you are all, and we are all capable of excellence. And, and uh, with uh, the kids, no, you don't have to do it like I do it, but you have to, all of the things that you learn, all the technique that you learn, all that uh, assimilate, all that you can ingest, every style, every, everything that you can, can uh, 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 what is that? Make a part of you, but at the same time, make your own. And then, and then we are there to, to guide you, challenge you as far as that, that is concerned. And I think that, that the challenge only makes you. Debbie Allen was, a, was a, a student of mine and one of my dancers. Oh no, we came to, to you know, like real arguments about what it is, but you, everybody makes their own way. You know, but one, but you, I think that you have to be set upon that way. If you get, you, if you are nurtured in in such a way, you become that excellence. You know, and and there's no jealousy or anything like that. What's for you is for you. But I'm saying that she became, she's gone on to do a great things like a lot of the dancers and a lot of the uh, people that I have mentored, as well as it exposed to my style of, you know, um, of dance and my style of, uh, of direction and so forth. So it's like, uh, it's, it, it's fluid, as you say, fluid. And, and I don't think that we've all been fluid enough. I think that, I, I, as again, here I go again, you know, singing you, got, you guys' praises about, you know, taking the initiative and stepping out there. That is what it is. And, and you know, nobody's going to have, I, I don't think, hurt feelings. You're comrades. And, you know, and we can, and some of us can really can deal with that. Actually, it's great for the challenge. The challenge is really great. And how um, we look at each other and how we 
and how much we borrow and how much we, you know, turn into our own thing is, is what we're looking for. I'm looking for that. Because how else are you going to have another conversation? I'm looking for more conversations. And that's why you like a little uh, uh, back and forth as far as what we do and where, and where we stand. It's, it's, it, all you have to do is just be fit for the battle because there's going to be a battle. And, and we don't want you to get your feelings hurt and come back, you know, get your feelings hurt and move on. Or not, <laughs> not get your feelings hurt. That's what I mean, and move on. That's what I'm saying. Constructive criticism, absolutely. Uh, I said constructive criticism. Right, is, is always is, is always good. Yes. So. I think this idea of mentorship was really a key part of Ellis Hazlip's. Uh, What should I say? Joie de vivre. Um, His persona. That was part of, yeah. It's, uh, he did. He challenged you now. He did was about pushing the culture forward and pushing from behind and quietly. He was a quiet revolutionary, but he really believed that the next generation and the young folks and the people that were, you know, in the trenches, in the movement, they were the ones that needed shepherding. He was constantly taking people under his wing. Ellis Hazlip brought in so many people who, to Channel 13, WNET, which was a flagship uh, PBS station at the time that produced uh, Soul. And he gave opportunities to people when black people couldn't get jobs in PBS or, at, or in any type of public broadcasting job. He would bring in people. Those people turn out to be folks like Sam Pollard uh, or, uh, gosh, who am I thinking? Um, well, there were so many people that he mentored directly to get to help them get jobs, help them be a part of the system. I know that he also mentored Stanley Nelson, who's a great, incredible um, documentary filmmaker now. He mentored so many people in, the, in, in places where they were harder to reach. He would go to the Sing Sing prison and record a beautiful album of the people who are incarcerated. He would record their voices singing and reading poetry. He never saw you as being defined by the place you were in or your station or whatever was, was really holding you back or, or defining you in a way. And that's redundant, but- Or finding your voice. Finding your voice is very important. Finding your voice is what I think he did. Yes, and also he was always encouraging people to see, he saw things in people that they didn't see in themselves. And so this idea of creating, for example, the very first minority, work, minority writers workshop, that had never been done because nobody had really thought of black people as being writers. And you hear James Baldwin, getting back to your point earlier, talking to, pardon me, hit the computer, <laughs> talking to Nikki Giovanni, about, well, you know, the world doesn't even believe there's such a thing as a black writer. This idea that the black literary canon hadn't been justified or validated or ascribed in a way, again, that issue of value. Sorry, keep hitting it. Okay. Um, it's this notion that it was so important to mentor people and provide the next opportunity. For example, that minority uh, writers workshop happened up in Terrytown. Many people had never left the city and it was the first minority conference where he was bringing together all different types of black writers, poets, writers, television writers, theatrical writers, uh, people who were trying to get their feet into television. And that was really unusual for Ellis to say, we're gonna do something that hasn't been done, but I'm gonna mentor you and bring out the best in you. And we have done that also with the film. It's really important to engage with our young African-American uh, folks because you never feel like black people, young black people get the opportunity to be in the industry the way others may have. And so we always engage um, interns and we work together with Howard University and engage students there who were, because Ellis Hayes went to Howard and that he's, you know, DC pride, DC proud. Uh, that was always very important to us. We engaged with the, um, City University of New York to find journalism students and people who were 
getting their degrees in broadcast journalism and invited them to be production interns or post-production interns and help us shoot things and help us with our social media. We created an entire HBCU tour when we only had a work in progress. And the way we did that was we worked together with students and mentored them. And they in turn uh, at Howard helped us connect to folks at Coppin State and Morgan State and the Greeks and this whole world and, and having this opportunity to share cross generationally, generationally. And that was really very important to Ellis. And uh, I think this notion of mentoring each one, teach one, my motto is, you know, black women who lift as they climb. This idea that we're bringing each other up, that we're lifting each other up. And I think of soul as like the tide that raised all boats for all of these great artists at this, at this moment because everybody needed to be lifted up and to be put in the laps of America. And the television allowed that to happen was quite unique. Of course, it was pre-FCC and um, you know, there's no second sec seven second delay, so they couldn't prevent it. But just this notion of we lift each other up and we do have that in our community in spite of the complexities and the differences and, the, and being diametrically opposed at times, all of that is embraced. And, and you did see that in, in, in Seoul. You saw that Ellis was proud of the disagreement as well as the agreement or this opportunity to, to create community even with the differences of opinion in the audience um, and with the arts. So I think that it, we must continue to lift each other up and using right. this as a tool is key. And I hope to find- as well to take it to HBCUs and to put it in schools and to create learning modules around this, all of this content, which is really historic, but at the same time, it's, it's usable, it's teachable. It's our history and black history is American history. So it's, it, the time is now for all of this. And this idea of mentoring and bringing each other along is, is super key. Absolutely. Joanna, I, I feel like mentorship has been an underlying thing that have, has been in your responses as you talk about your work as a gallerist and as it, with your work in We Buy Gold and in the sense of protection, right? So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and how mentorship looks, what mentorship looks like within your work. Um, I mean, I have to think about my, primarily my own experience with mentorship and and not only just for my own you know, education and professional growth, and, and I've been lucky enough to have some really amazing mentors, but also for sheer survival, you know, and just like existing in these spaces with, it's, it's invaluable, it's, it's necessary to have mentors um, just for navigating these spaces when, um, you know, isolation can feel, it can be so at the forefront of, you know, any kind of work within these spaces. So for me, that's it's been tremendously helpful. Um, I, you know, I still feel like I'm 20 in my head, so I have a hard time like really articulating about you know being a mentor. But um, I, I think it's it's a responsibility. But also, you know, as we're talking about you know tie lifting all boats and supporting each other and lifting each other up, I mean that goes back to the conversation around sustainability also and the importance of making sure that we're building community so that, you know, we're not the only ones in the room and to really, you know, reject that kind of idea around, you know, reject any kind of ideas of, of success and in infiltrating spaces and being the only one there. The answer is, is not and making sure that you are opening up doors and allowing for space for other people as much as possible and it is as valuable to our own work lives and experiences um, as it would be for anyone coming behind us, I think also in terms of our own growth and building. I mean, I think that I learned from, I know that I learned from, um, you know, younger folks who are interested in the field and want to have conversations. Within those conversations, I'm also challenging what I believe and what I'm doing. And I'm also thinking, you know, thinking and rethinking my own values as I have those conversations. So it's absolutely goes both ways. Mentorship in terms of artists and protection. Um, I kind of think of that a little bit more as ad advocacy. Like I suppose there's some kind of mentorship in there. I just, um, you know, I think there's kind of an underlying kind of power dynamic inferred in, the, in talking about mentorship that I don't necessarily 
feel like fits in with um, what I would like to think of my relationship with the artists that I work with. Um, but I do think that that's in there and, um, and hoping that what I know and what I've been taught can be valuable for artists who are coming out and trying to understand the landscape. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. So, so work. I was just thinking about um, something you said in a moment in the film where we have uh, Kwame Ture, Sophie Carmichael talking about, it's a it's an archival clip and he's you know talking about the end of indi individualism yeah. and, and individualism is dead and now is not the time. We really can't focus on that anymore. And I love that idea because that, that sort of dovetailed with the whole black arts movement and coming together and thinking yes. about the nation. As That's a nation. right. And Rafa representing that time. And when you think about the Black Arts Movement, of course, since we're in the, you know, the hallowed halls of the museum here, the studio museum, and you think about the chapters of the Black Arts Movement, if it were a book, we would open with Maria Baraka and, and the last chapter would close with, you know, Sonia Sanchez. Thankfully, she's uh, still here, so we haven't closed that book. But this notion of uh, coming together and, 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 and the idea of nation time and that's why we had that in the film, this idea of being a rallying cry for coming together as a nation of people. Right. That's just such an exciting... An, er an emergency. Yes. Every, everybody, every man, woman, child. Ah! You know, emergency. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that, that I use the visualism... <laughs> You know, rejecting individualism during this time is, is, is so imperative, considering environmentally, socially, politically where we are. So thank you for bringing that, bringing that into the conversation. Um, we're going to transition into Q&A. If you all are ready, I'm just going to take a few questions as we're right. nearing our end time. Um, so the first question, uh, I want to ask panelists to reflect on the role of the church in Black cultural production. Would love to hear from George, Melissa, and Taylor, given given her upcoming exhibition focus on spirituality. Um, wow! Ooh, I'm I'm just, the church. I'll let you guys go first, and the I'll, church, I'll we, wrap it up. Right. Where else could we go? What else could we do? Back when I was growing up, you know, we were the church was the center of of everything that that we did socially, economically, you know, uh, culturally. You know, you did pageants and at Christmas, you did, you know, you had uh, um, all, all of the things that we thought we were missing were all there while you were growing up, whether you realized it or not. I, uh, parents must have loved us so much that they made sure. And I, I guess it goes along with every generation that I'm gonna give my kids everything I didn't, I didn't have. And, that, and if they gave us love, that was the greatest gift that they could give us. So because we were going to go out and meet a world that wasn't so kind. And if they filled us up with that love, the, the church, the lessons, the parables, that the preacher would give, that you could live by, that that everybody said, oh, oh, that sermon lasted me all week. I guess I'll go back next Sunday and get filled up again. So it's it was it was um, all of those things that the revolution grew out of a church, the women of the church, the children of the church, because the men had to go to work, and the women, the women. And now more than ever, it is your time, you know, to to show us. We got to lean on you now, for real. Uh, only because, you know, the, the brothers, you know, so, you know, we fall by the, you know, we're not as aware, acutely aware of the things that we should, would, we should be doing because everybody needs support. Every, you can't, you can't do any of this alone. So I, we need the women, like we need the men, like we need everybody that we can, all hands on deck is, is what the cry should be. And then, uh, and then uh, quite, uh, if we confess, and we're here to confess too, uh, you know, we need these women to do everything 
to thank these women for all the work that they have done and let them go and do more work that they know that they can do, that they are good at, that they are capable of, that they're smart enough to do. They got it. So I'm happy about all, all of this because it's so great to, to see a sister that you can lean on. You know what I mean? And you can talk about all of the other things. You know, you're not the rock all the time. You know, so it's like, let's, let's, let's lean on the other rock too. I love, George, how you transition from the church and the, the, the strength of the church as being like the, the, the strength of Black culture to moving that segue into the strength of Black women. And I know, speaking for Ellis Hayslip, that the church was a very big part of his foundation. But also, I have to say that, you know, Ellis lived a duality often. And because as a queer man, as a queer Black man, the dualities within the love of his family and also the rejection of his family also can be found in the black church. And that is not always a, uh, an equal, uh, you know, a really great easy, easy road, you know, to travel. Right. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. But I also, we, we do explore that in the film and, but there is an undying love for the church. And as George says, this idea of the church being foundational, and you see that also in the writing of James Baldwin and the struggles that he had uh, with, uh, you know, being accepted by his family and go tell it on the mountain and coming from a religious family. Ellis Hayslip also came from that religious family and, and struggled for acceptance uh, for, his, for being queer. And, but I think what that, what that gave him was this strength and this innate magic and this idea that he was always balancing these both sides of love and, and I won't say hate, but love and no love or rejection and acceptance. And, and you see that in his work too. You see this, this love affair with the sacred and the profane and his ability to line up, you know, really raunchy artists uh, and, and people who were unapologetically uh, themselves <laughs> and then some of uh, a, a loftier beautiful more elegant uh, artist at the same time and he saw all those facets in the community and so in a way the black church and he he said that that was really very important to him and that that was the foundation of black pride and the and the floor of black pride really but this notion that his sermon his gospel was even though he was informed by gospel. For him, it was the gospel of song, the gospel according to song. So always finding that, yes, there is strength in, in the church and the tenets of the church, but there are also things that, don't, that disagree with some of those tenets, but that doesn't mean we can't love it all the same and that you can't have these dualities in life and these, um, you know, these different roads and these, it's like code switching. Right, it's like the, the person you have to be depending on the situation you're in. And I'm not saying code switching for being queer because Ellis was, was openly gay and, and very situated, very centered in that. I just think that the church made him and defined him, but also helped him understand the world that he had to push back against in order to be free. Absolutely. You know what I'm that's, saying? That's called love and understanding. Isn't that Al Green? <laughs> <laughs> That's love and happiness, but I'll take right. it. <laughs> no, I, I, I especially love this question about the Black church because it is uh, so much ingrained in the very fabric of how we show up in this country, in this work, in this world. Um, I grew up in a, a Baptist church in Detroit, Michigan called Tabernacle Missionary Baptist. And for me, it was, it was a site where I learned about, first learned about vulnerability through witnessing incarnation and this sort of idea of, uh, of spiritual possession, right? Mm. Um, I learned about desire, about that wanting to be uh, sort of touched by the Holy Spirit, um, wanting to be anointed with hands, right? Um, and so, so much of, um, even though I identify more so as agnostic and just spiritual in this moment, uh, so much of the Black church shows up for me and just how I relate to the world. And my exhibition is very much um, concerned with that. And so much of the show is informed by the scholarship of um, Sean Crawley, 
who wrote a book about Black Pentecostalism specifically, and he talks about queerness as a form of relation. So I'm glad that you brought that up. He talks about queerness as a form of relation within the Black church and sort of navigating in a queer embodiment, the difficulties, but also the pleasures and the joys that come along within the Black church space. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my show, my exhibition at the California African American Museum is very much guided by that ethos of thinking about queerness in the context of particularly Black Pentecostalism and how the sacred and the secular sort of overlap in more ways than, than we would like it to, or at least like to admit. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm specifically exploring through um, a range of artists, the sort of choreosonics that come from that space um, and how, how pleasurable they are, right? Um, so, you know, uh, Enunciated Life will be open this, uh, this fall, hopefully. Um, and I hope that if you all make it out to LA that you'll be able to see it. I'm gonna try. Please. I'm gonna try. Please. It, would be, it would be great to have you. There's a scene in the film that, uh, where Nikki Giovanni is performing with the New York Community Choir and she's performing this extraordinary piece that many of us are familiar with uh, from her uh, album, spoken word album, Truth is on Its Way. And she talks about how she grew up in the Baptist church as well. And that's the church was everything she knew. But as she emerged as an artist, also wanting to push back and that love and push constantly that uh, that is so important. And I love seeing that performance when Benny Diggs, shout out to Benny Diggs if you're out. Not Benny. <laughs> Benny Diggs is, has these wonderful choir members from Harlem singing uh, this piece by, was it James Cleveland, right? Who wrote- Yes, Peace Be Still. And yet you're hearing this profoundly, um, almost antagonistic, belligerent, beloved, insistent, raucous poetry that is completely the antithesis, but then you realize, but wait a minute, it isn't, because it is born of this and this idea of this duality. And, and Ellis Hazlett created that opportunity because she wanted to do gospel, she was raised on gospel, I beg your pardon, and wanted to do her poetry to gospel. And many people don't know that that was his idea. And so that, that album, which became iconic and her performance of all that poetry, he also helped to produce that album and has written all the liner notes for those of us lucky to have an album still. If you pull it out, you'll see the liner notes. And this idea of always creating that duality for his artists to express themselves in ways in which, yes, they're informed by the church, they're in love with the church, it's part of who we are, but we also engage with it differently and we have the right to have that. I really appreciate how encyclopedic you are in sort of um, honoring that history related to the show. You're able to just talk about it so fluidly and I, I just really appreciate it just going in and out. Um, I wanna just move into the last question and thank you all before I get into it. It was really great talking with you all this evening. Um, there's this question that someone posed, how has the space to develop other structures shifted since the 1960s? Mm. For all, what might soul the show look like if televised, if televised today and who would be on it? So perhaps Melissa, you can open you can open us up with that, given that you have this encyclopedic knowledge on the oh, show. Thank you. I, I'm, that's so you're very kind. Uh, when I think of who would be on a soul for today, it's interesting. We did this talk back uh, right after the premiere of Soul of Mr. Soul uh, in the virtual cinemas uh, two weeks ago, and it was hosted by the incredible Amanda Seals, and we chose her because she had actually. Many people may have seen this. She was responsible single-handedly for making a clip of the James Baldwin, Nikki Giovanni episode go viral uh, a year ago on, on Instagram. And, and people were engaging with this clip, over 455,000 people, almost half a million people engaging with this as if it were right now, today. Not some precious gem from another time or some yes. Bible piece. But what are these black people saying to each other now about love, about partnership, about a black man and womanhood and relationships and family and all the, all the conflicts and love around all of that. And what was so interesting to me was 
when I realized that she would be the right person to host the kickback, it was when I started delving into her work and was listening to some of her podcasts. You know, she has these amazing podcasts that she does. And she was talking to um, Eddie Gloud, who has a new book on uh, James Baldwin, Begin Again. And she said that Ella, that she's, pardon me, she said that James Baldwin was the closest thing she had to an idol and that she carried herself, she fashioned herself, carrying herself uh, the way he did as a, as a creative and a black intellect. And I thought, wow, that is so profound. And I looked at her work collectively, not just what she did on Insecure and hosting the BET Awards, but all of her, the way she's engaging with people and raising this conversation and said, she is the legacy of soul in a way. She's fearless, she's bold, she's revolutionary, and she's bringing together all these voices of our time. And I started to think, well, who else could be the new voice of soul? There are so many people who are doing that kind of work and pushing it forward. It's hard to imagine a new platform because it would, we'd have to find a platform that wasn't beholden to commercialization or you know, needing to promote or have ads popping in at, to, to create that same sense of freedom and intimacy would be difficult. But I think we definitely need a space like this right now. And there are artists out there who are having these kinds of conversations. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really interested in who's curating the culture now and who's hosting the culture now. I think we could have a, a longer conversation, but I wanna let in, anyone else jump in on that. No? Joanna. <laughs> well, I'll just, I'll just. Oh, at the in the, at the, I think that's a that's a great recommendation. It's 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 oh. such an interesting question to think through, and one that I would probably be sitting with from here on out. Yeah. Um, I feel that because social media has allowed us to democratize our access to visibility. Mm -hmm there's there's a lot of Ellis Haslips out there, you know what I mean, in that yeah. way. But there's these Instagram TV shows and so on and so forth. So I, I, I do think that a platform like Soul um, is necessary in this moment, but I, I feel that rather than remaking it, we just need to discover it and it's already happening in yeah. real time on, on IGTV. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on it. Well, also, it, it, it's happening when you see artists sort of representing themselves differently in and being post genre about how they they share their work, whether it's new artists who don't feel the need to be beholden to a label or they're dropping, you know, clearing their Spotify and starting over, starting fresh and having the audacity to do that or the audacity to drop something like Black is King or or just to be fabulous and not really explain it or or and, right you know, absolutely absolutely post-genre moment that that's very exciting that these the, the fluidity of art is changing and the way people occupy that space is changing and so that energy shift is definitely happening and i know that ellis hazel was paving the way for that shift because he saw that as a possibility but he was encouraging people to take flight Absolutely. I think I think that's a great note to end on. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you, George. Thank you, Joanna, for your incredible remarks today and for making the time uh, to sit and talk with me about this incredible offering. Um, check out the Soul documentary if you haven't already. It's a must see. And um, thank you, everybody. Please stay safe out there. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you. Love and happiness, yeah. Something that can make you do wrong, make you do right, yeah. Love. Love and happiness But wait a minute, something's going wrong 
someone's on the phone. Three o'clock in the morning. Talking about how she can make it right. Yeah. 